Sometimes to draw attention to an issue takes extreme action and protest, and sometimes it takes a famous face or two to help you along the way. Up next to talk about the role that activism plays in the environmental fight are a filmmaker, a grassroots movement leader, and the lead singer of Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. With that, let's bring together the Young Turks, Anna Kasparian. Please put your hands together for Josh Fox, Anna Kleinheinz, and Alex Ebert. Hey everyone, how are you guys? Thank you for being here uh, for this very important discussion about environmental activism, especially now in the Trump era where there have been a number of executive actions taken to roll back any and all protections uh, for the environment that we've managed to uh, get past. And so with us today is Josh Fox. He is, of course, legendary filmmaker and also political activist. We also have Anne Kleinhens, who is the leader of Up To Us. She's one of the co-founders, and we'll talk about that movement in just a second. And finally, last but not least, Alex Ebert, who is the lead singer of Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's get started a little with what environmental activism means to you. Why are you three here talking about the issue? What have you done in regard to environmental activism? And I'd like to start with you. Oh, good. Um, well, environmental activism means everything to me. It makes sense. We have to have a planet that's keeping us alive, that we're keeping alive, and that we can leave um, for our you know, generations to come. So what I have done during this last year was we were very focused on Standing Rock, so the pipeline, the fight that our native um, brothers and sisters had, specifically, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about Up To Us? Um, you know, it's an organization, a movement that you co-founded with actors Shailene Woodley, and you're doing mm -hmm. some pretty amazing stuff there. Yeah, so what we did is, um, <clears throat> after last year's primary, there was a lot of, uh, the Democratic primary, there was a lot of people that were very, angry about you know, various issues and um, there was a lot of people that wanted to disengage from the political process. So we, we made it a nonpartisan movement and said no, we need every young person engaged because what wasn't being talked about even in the election itself was the actual issues. It, it became a Trump and Hillary and character but the issues were missing. So what we're doing with our organization is we go into the communities, we go what are the issues that, you're, that you care about, that you're fighting for, and help them organize. I love that. Yeah. Alex, you are a musical artist uh, who has gotten a little political, especially during the last election cycle. Can you talk to me a little bit about that and why you felt you know, motivated to support a candidate like Bernie Sanders? Uh, yeah, I think uh, for me, I just felt his truth sort of seeping through. And, and I think that's when a lot of people were sort of befuddled by all these kids sort of digging this old man, I think that what they saw was this guy that was sort of unhinged in that sort of truthy way. And uh, that's always refreshing, it sort of transcends whatever age. And, uh, and then, of course, he was speaking about things the way that I saw them, more or less. Um, Especially the environment. Uh, environmental yeah. issues weren't something that you heard many of the candidates talking about over and over again, but yeah, he, it was a consi he, consistent message with Bernie. He fell in with the rest of the science community, um, which was this weird you know, thing for a politician to do. Um, and that was nice, refreshing to hear someone just say it like it has been discovered to be. Um, and, and you know, that's important. Um, yeah. So he had that important message about protecting, protecting our environment, doing more to you know, conserve and to ensure that you know, the future of this planet will be intact for future generations. Um, but he didn't win. He didn't win the primary, he didn't win the presidency. We now have Donald Trump as our president and he has been pretty aggressive in being friendly to corporate interests that aren't necessarily friendly to our environment. And it's very demoralizing, it's very discouraging for those who have been politically active because it feels as though we're losing. Uh, what is your response to that, Josh? Well, I think the, when you are processing a loss, you gotta figure out what exactly happened. 
Right. And I mean, I was on the platform committee. I was appointed by Bernie Sanders to go write the Democratic platform. And we could see the division in the room of people who were supposedly progressives, this Democratic Party, mm -hmm. whereas you had all these people on the Hillary Clinton side who were pro-fracking, who were pro-big banks, who were pro-war. Um, and these were not the progressive values that we thought the Democratic Party was supposed to stand for, right? And so when you have um, you know, the leaders of the Democratic establishment taking money from these huge corporations that are like literally polluting the ground underneath our feet, um, you have a problem. And I think the lack of the inspiring message that people could actually get behind, in terms of the environment, was one of the major ones, right? I think right. if Hillary Clinton had come out and did one speech about Dakota Access Pipeline, had said, no, I'm, I'm with Bernie, let's ban fracking, she would have won this election. And we got up there in front of those people and said, this is what happened. So when you want to look at the fix that we're in right now, where you have an avowed racist, authoritarian president, who is in many ways, who's anti-science, who is anti the environment, who's willing to give away everything that we have to ExxonMobil, basically, who is now, the George Carlin joke has never been more true, right? America is an oil company with an army. That is really basically the truth now when you have Rex Tillerson being the Secretary of State. So how did we get here? We got here because the people who are supposedly standing up for progressive values sold out. And, they, and, and a lot of folks around America did not find that message inspiring mm -hmm. and could not bring themselves um, to, not that they didn't vote for Hillary Clinton, but they didn't bring their friends to vote. And, and presidential races and politics in America are won on enthusiasm. If we don't have enthusiasm, we, we lose. So here we are now, and we are dealing with Rex Tillerson as Secretary of State, former CEO of ExxonMobil. We're dealing with uh, a, a previous victory of DAPL being completely destroyed, and now uh, you know the construction of DAPL is almost complete. Uh, we have the signing of the permits for the Keystone XL pipeline. Everything that environmental activists have fought against is, is now happening. And so what do you do? How do you push forward knowing that you have an administration that is pro-corporate interests, that does not care about protecting the environment? What type of activism can we push for that will be effective? Josh. Well, I mean, in New York State, we banned fracking, and they told us that we were never going to do that. Right? Mm -hmm. They said not that that train's left the station. It took six years, mm -hmm. but it was hundreds of thousands of people organizing in every tiny little town all across New York State. Mm -hmm. Like, and this wasn't like your big name environmental organizations. These were mom and pop, like startup environmental orgs with five people sitting around their, you know, breakfast table on a Saturday morning, gathering their their friends and neighbors, mm -hmm. and they bird dogged Governor Andrew Cuomo every step of the way. The guy could not have a birthday party you know, without 500 fractivists showing up outside the Plaza Hotel saying, happy birthday, Governor Cuomo, bad fracking. I mean, it was that kind of life or death <laughs> issue. So we have to take a look at all the successful movements throughout history. There have always been ups and downs. There have always been moments where we lost something, right? But look at the civil rights movement. Look at what happened with the women getting the vote. And we have to put our lives and our bodies in the way, in the same way that they did. Mm -hmm. You know, Susan B. Anthony was beaten when she went to go vote. Martin Luther King was arrested 40 times. We don't win anything unless we have a movement that's willing to put itself in those positions. You cannot just click through this and win. We need to be involved or else we're not going to get our democracy back in any stretch of the imagination. And certainly we're gonna see a lot of damage done to the environment. So Anne, backstage you and I had a, a pretty fiery discussion <laughs> about our current political system and yeah. what we believe needs to change in order to protect the environment and you know even outside of protecting the environment pass legislation that represents the American people versus corporate interests right yeah. and so you brought up the idea and the importance of having more than two political parties uh, and I want you to kind of elaborate on that a little bit why do you think it's important to kind of move out of this Republican versus Democrat paradigm. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's two things, right? One is the third party, and then it's also taking money out of politics. What we have right now is we have a system where I can't hold anybody accountable because if, if one person goes, as Trump, you know, Trump goes, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and I go, oh, this is horrible, and the Democratic side doesn't give me a good enough response or nothing that I want, I can't hold them accountable. I can't go, well, what happens if I don't vote for you? If, even if we'd had a third party now, uh, or would have had one this last election, we wouldn't have had 
I don't know if we wouldn't have had Trump. If it was a strong political party, mm -hmm. the Democrat, there's, um, you hold pe people accountable by making them do the right thing, right? So when we boycott, we hold companies accountable by making them do the right thing. We can't do that in a two-party system because it's always just going to be the lesser of two evils and they can get away with way too much stuff that we don't want. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the history of how DC and Washington, our politicians have been voting over the last 20, 30, what was it? 30 years or so, that Harvard did a study on 80% of the time Washington voted against the will of the American people. That's across the board. That didn't matter if it was Obama in charge or somebody else. So there's something fundamentally very wrong that needs to be addressed. And right now we can't address it because we have no leverage. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, the only reason why corporate interests <coughs> do get represented more than the American people is because they have, you know, literally the currency yeah. um, and the influence and the power to get the attention of our representatives, our elected officials, uh, as opposed to the electorate. You know, you can't really compete with that. Alex, what do you have to say about all this? What do you think is the main issue within our current political system? What do you think needs to be reformed in order to actually push forward with real change? Well, uh on that note, I, I do think that the, the electoral system needs to be sort of fundamentally reoriented toward a real representative democracy. 61% of us don't feel represented, but in fact 80 of us, 80% of us aren't represented. You take a look at the polls and then the way people are voting. Um, so actually, with regard to the, the name of the stage, the tech thing, uh, myself and uh, founder of uh, uh, Capital Bells, which is the first time the... Uh, the system that alerts uh, Congress people if there's a vote or not uh, has now been disseminated in an app. And uh, we're taking that back in and sort of reappropriating it in something called proxy.vote mm -hmm. for the midterms coming up, where the people that are running run on a mandate collected uh, by sort of crowdsourcing the, the platform, which is then a mandate because it's sourced from the crowd. You're not coming up with a platform. And then you have proxies that have pledged themselves to be the proxy or the representative, but a true proxy so that they're just sort of implementing and speaking for the mandate that the people come up for. And if they deviate from the mandate, they're penalized financially. Um, mm. You get $220,000 if you get elected and they'd be penalized that fee plus some. Um, so it'd be sort of a, a method of honor, honoring the mandate of the people. And the people would be able to vote in real time, see what votes are coming up, so that the proxy is always informed and reinformed uh, of what their constituency want. And what this would do to the, the lobbyists is they would no longer be able to go to these proxies and ask them to vote a certain way because they can't quarterback or originate anything. They'd have to then turn to the people and the constituency that inform the proxy. Mm -hmm. of what their mandate is and start bringing all this information out into the light. You want to drill there? Okay, explain us why. Um, and I think that there's a fundamental sort of need and you can no longer argue, well, we need this sort of intermediation with, uh, with representatives because the people are illiterate and they don't really know what's going on. That's not the case anymore. We have the technology and, 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 and power uh, to implement a true representative democracy. Now, there is a disconnect between, you know, what our politicians say, uh, what the media says, and what the American people are actually doing. So, on one hand, you have our politicians still having this ridiculous debate as to whether or not climate change is happening, and if they agree that climate change is happening, they disagree that it's man-made. Um, but at the same time, you look at the electorate, you look at the American people, and their behavior is changing. You see that they're more conscious of you know, where they're spending their money, how it's impacting our planet, what they can do to reuse and recycle certain things. And Anne, we had a discussion about that as well. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what you're experiencing with Americans. Do you see a shift in their behavior as I described? Or do you think that, you know, there's some truth to, you know, this American apathy that continues to be a little bit of a problem? Right. Um, Absolutely, there's, I mean, it comes in waves, just like yeah. Josh was saying, right? Movements come in waves, but we traveled, I mean, you included, we traveled almost all of the U.S. last year um, for various reasons, you know, your movie or canvassing or Dakota Access, and everybody is really engaged, and it's about pinpointing that, and Josh spoke about that earlier backstage as well, it's about being really, really specific what we target, and while it's great that we have, you know, things like the Women's March, it's necessary because it, it gets the hype up, 
-hmm. to march and get everybody mobilized and it was beautiful to be there but the specific calls to actions and pointing people and this is how we get X, Y, and Z done need to be there and people need to be informed so systems like yours or um, you know, we work together on the How to Divest website. A lot of our daily behavior is actually funding these corporations that we're then marching to fight. That's from buying a water bottle to everything else. So there's, again, tech bridges it with, with apps like Bicot. You scan in the product and it tells you what they support and what they don't support. So you can move on to the next product and you can almost be a slacktivist by literally just changing what you buy. Right. You might have a bigger impact than marching on the street. And all is necessary, right? Everything is necessary. But we can, everybody can fight their own fight. And I think it's just giving people the solutions. If this is what you're comfortable with and this is what you do, I'm comfortable in going on the front lines. So is Josh. Obviously, we need more people like that as well. But there's no apathy. That that whole story that the media is telling, or that the youth is, at, that, that's not right. And it's yeah, not true. I, I, I do want to focus on the media quite a bit because I have a media background. Um, you know, I'm a host and producer for the Young Turks, which is a an independent news outlet. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes we get frustrated because these are issues that we want to inform the public on, and we do. And then we, you know, turn to cable news to kind of see what's going on with them. And you, you see, you know. A, a week-long news coverage on the missing plane. That's an old example, but yeah. that's one of the things that would drive us crazy because there were actual things happening in the country that needed um, some focus. You guys are more than activists because you are educating the public about what they can do, what the reality is about our environment. How do we get the corporate media to finally pay attention to the type of media coverage that the American people actually want and need to learn about. Josh? Well, I think we need new media. I mean, obviously you believe that you're working with the Young Turks and not CNN. A little biased. Like. I, mean, and, I mean, my films, the Gasland films and How to Let Go of the World and Love All the Things Climate Can't Change, those were on HBO. But because you had a renegade like Sheila and Evans, who was the executive producer, um, uh, of, of HBO documentaries, who was there as that revolutionary force. My last, my latest film, which came out last week, Awake, A Dream from Sandy Rock, we went straight to the public uh, from our website. But the truth of the matter is, who's telling the story and what story are you telling? I mean, a lot of what we talk about in terms of activism and the environment becomes translated as this consumer behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll give you what Bill, because a lot of times we get criticized and say, oh, well, you took a plane to where you were going. Didn't you use fossil fuels to get there and so on and so forth? Well, the truth of the matter is we could develop a zero carbon program and say, let's get it really super successful and get 30 million people mm -hmm. to go to a zero carbon lifestyle. That would be like a wildly successful program, right? That's 10% of the American population. So you'd have a 10% reduction in carbon emissions. Everybody who knows anything about climate science knows that's nowhere near enough. However, if you got 30 million people go to Washington, D.C. and start to protest in the streets and shut institutions down that were promoting you know, climate denial or were promoting fossil fuels, you would see a much, much bigger change in policy. So the point is, you've got to tell that story about politics to the American people. You can't just go out there and be like, oh, well, yeah, you just change your water bottles and all that kind of stuff because this is a distraction. The truth of the matter is we change things because we change politics. We change politics when we become invested in and activated, and you need far fewer people to do that, then you need to say like, oh, let's buy a different kind of light bulb. You know what I mean? And everybody in the tech sector, you got to understand, this is, technology is important, important, no question. Solar panels, we need them, but you need to be politically involved or else you, you, you're kidding yourself if you think you're actually doing something. All right, guys, unfortunately that does it for our panel. I can't believe we're already out of time, but thank you to Josh Fox and Klein Hens and also Alex Ebert. Thank you for being here and listening to this conversation. I appreciate it. I like that ending, bro. That was good. <laughs>